Okay, so the first thing we need to understand for section 8.5, uh, we're going to talk about normal distributions. Um, so the first thing we should just make sure we understand is what does it mean to be normal? So when we're, everything up to this point has, uh, has had a distribution that could be of any shape. So we had some frequency table and our distribution may have been right skewed or it could have been left skewed. Um, so meaning the frequency, how, how many times something occurred, versus its value would be on the x-axis uh, at this point. Hopefully we're pretty comfortable with that as long as we can spell the word value. There we go. Okay, so frequency, value, it, it, they could have had any kind of shape they wanted. They didn't have to be unimodal or they could have just, it could have been crazy. It could have been something, you know, maybe like this. It didn't really matter. But what it means to be normal is it has a very specific shape. Uh, the first quality is that it is symmetric. The second quality would be that it is unimodal. Um, and that you can get into a bit more in the details on this, but for this class that about covers it. So what does it mean to be symmetric and unimodal? All right, well, it means on our frequency table, you know, if you consider this your value, and again, this the frequency, um, Symmetric just means it if you it has a mirror image of itself, and unimodal means it has one hump, um, so it has one mode. So it's got to look something like that. That's a terrible drawing, but there you go. You got the idea. So it has some line of symmetry that you could draw right down the mode, and it should have a mirror image of itself to both sides. So when people start talking about outliers, when you get into more heavy statistics, they're going to say the outliers should be balanced. The outliers on the low end should be equal to the outliers on the high end, um, or there should be no outliers at all. Um, so you can imagine where they go with this, but for this class that's the big idea. Now, a key thing we need to understand is that we're going to look at it from a probability standpoint. So we're not going to say the frequency, but we're going to talk about the probability of the frequency, which means these things still have the same shape because if something happens more often, it's going to have a higher probability. So therefore, at this point, while it's the mode, it still has the highest probability. These values have the lowest frequency are going to have the lowest probability. So the shape doesn't change much, but what we're going to have to talk about is the area under the curve. So if these things are going to represent probabilities, then we should know that the area under here, and here comes your your uh, calculus review, this area under the curve, the probability of all the the area um, has to equal 1. That's uh, not necessarily a great notation. So just what we call it, the area has to equal 1. And when you add up all the different probabilities, because if you think about it, it's all the different values. So if you think of it like shoe sizes, what's the probability that somebody has a shoe size that's a 2, a 3, a 4, let's call the mean shoe size a 5, who knows if it actually is, and so on and so forth when you add up all the different shoe sizes and the probability of everybody having those shoe sizes, it has to equal 100%. You're going to cover 100% of the people. So there's your there's our big idea. Um, so the third little attribute we want to understand here is that the area under the curve equals 1. So with this, we can continue our previous conversations from the last sections. This set of data, these random variables, um, will still have similar property, properties that we need to discuss that were similar to the last sections. So our variable, our values are all going to carry datas, uh, data, and we're going to care about the mean for, of our data. Um, so let me just make up some terrible example. So let's call the uh, mean 4, all right, with a standard deviation of 2. I'm being a little goofy with my notation here. If I'm doing mean, let's just understand for us, we don't care about notation more um, advanced statistics classes are going to really distinguish between this. For us, mu and mean, same thing. I mean, not same thing, but they're both mean, mean. Standard deviation of x or standard deviation of x. So anyway, so if you've seen the notations, that's all they really, we're going to think of them as interchangeable for this class. So these over here are standard deviation these over here are the concept of mean or average. Um, so we have our means, we have our standard deviations. So how does this relate to the normal curve? Well, back in the last section we were talking about distribution of, um, excuse me, we were talking about 
uh, variance, measures of dispersion. Well, this is going to have, again, a dispersion of 2 from a mean of 4. So what would the normal, and if we say it's a normal curve, what would this look like? Okay, so if we've got the mean and the median, or sorry, the mean and the standard deviation, that's going to have some effect on our normal curve and what that would look like. So, so for our normal curve, um, you know, we have the mean somewhere here at four, and then the standard deviation. So if we went up one standard deviation, that would put us at six. If we went up a second standard deviation, helps if you write standard deviations of 6. There we go. That would give us 8. Um, so now we've got two standard deviations from the mean. Let's try one more. So three standard deviations up, that would give us 10 because each time we're adding two. So same thing down. Uh, down one standard deviation would give us two. Um, let's scoot that out. There we go. Down another standard deviation. So let's say that's a negative one standard deviation. Um, that gives two. Down another one. That gives us zero. And then down another one. That would give us negative two. So I hope that part makes sense. So now, what would our, what would that mean for a normal curve? Well, we know the the mode has to be above the mean, and it's going to be symmetric coming down. Now the shape beyond that. Wow, that's terrible. The shape beyond that is anybody's guess. It just has to be symmetric. So one standard deviation up, one standard deviation down should be, not how I drew it, should be about the same. It's hard when you're freehanding. So the height there and the height there should be about the same. So when I look at these groupings, um, these rectangles, rectangle one, rectangle two, should be about the same. When I look at the next rectangles, those should be rectangle three and four should be about the same. I hope that makes sense. That's the big idea behind a standard deviation. Oh, sorry, excuse me. It's the big idea behind the normal curve. So here comes the punchline, what everybody's been waiting for. The formula. What is the standard, the normal curve formula? Well, it is a function of x. So here you go, the formula. Now the great news um, you actually never really need to use this all that much. The only time you'll need to use this um, after we get through this the introductory lesson would be in a case where we're gonna have we're gonna eventually have a table that circumvents using this formula. But if something isn't on the table, we go to this formula instead. So let's make sure we understand what everything is. What we're looking at here, down here, we have this is your standard deviation. Um, then we have 2 pi, pi is just pi, 2.14, sorry, 3.14, let's try again, e, uh, e is just e, uh, 2.718, um, the mu, that is our average, or our mean, um, and then again down here we have another standard deviation. Now in your book, this is coming, this is coming straight out of your book, section 8.5, so you can, um, you can look it up in there if you if you'd like to as well. Uh, just note that this whole little piece right here, all of this stuff right here, that's an exponent on the e. Okay. So what we're going to do? We're going to type this in the calculator really fast um, using the values from that we just I just wrote above, which were mean of four and standard deviation of two. So for this one, we're going to say it has a. We're going to use the formula with a mean of four and a standard deviation of two. All right. Let's pop pop that in. And when I say pop that in, what I actually mean is put it in the y equal sign. Um, so we're because we're going to graph it. So let me bring in my calculator here. Go y equals. So I'm just going to start typing it in right here. Okay. So now that you have your equation typed in, um, what we're going to do is we're going to hit graph. And I will say the hardest part of that whole thing is just typing it all in with all the right parentheses. It's terrible. All right. So there we go. We've got our. Oh, excuse me. Let me make sure we all understand the window. Um, so the window here, the window I have set is from negative 4 to 12 for the x values. Well, because if you think about what we know already about standard deviations, the you're not going to see much beyond the third standard deviation down, third standard deviation up. So if our, our mean is at 4, and this is 1, 2, 3 standard deviations down, if I go down to negative 4, 
that's going to be four standard deviations. I'm going to catch a whole bunch. I'm going to catch almost everything. Uh, and if I go three, four standard deviations up, that's going to be catch almost everything. So that's why, that's why, um, on my window, on my calculator, I chose to set it to go from negative four to twelve. Now, as far as the y values. Um, remember, our outputs are now talking about the probability of something occurring. It's a decimal, so the highest you could need to go is one. But therefore, what you're saying is at that you're you're saying at one point you expect it to be 100% of the occurring, you know, 100% probability, and that's not the case. So I set it to 0.5 to say to see um, if anything's even close to happening half the amount of time. So when we hit graph, you'll notice it doesn't even come close to halfway up, um, and that's okay. It's just so now you can see it. So now we have our, our little normal curve. You see it's symmetric. You see it has it's unimodal, has one hump. So now let's do the fun part and say, what what is the amount of area going from, so the amount of area under the curve, area under the curve, excuse me, um, where x is going to be somewhere between, the value is going to be somewhere between uh, one standard deviation down, which would be 2, I'll call it equal to, and one standard deviation up, which would be 6. So what is the area under the curve from, for that? Well, we're not going to integrate that by hand, because that would be actually be impossible. We're going to let the calculator do it for us. So if you remember how to do this from your brief calculus class, right here on the trace button, there's a calc. So we're going to go second, trace, and you'll see a little integral symbol number seven, so you can either press number seven, um, or you can always just use the arrow keys and go down to it. There we go, and hit enter. Now, the nice thing, we're not going to actually use, the for the lower limit, we're not going to use the arrow keys to do this, we're just going to type in our number. We want two, so I type two, and so it says the lower limit is x equaling two. Great, hit enter. Now the upper limit, we wanted that to be six, so we hit enter, and now the calculator shades in our, our area and we see it is 68 point or point six eight two six eight nine four nine does that number sound reminiscent of something familiar from the last section I hope it does the rule is 68 95 99 point seven the empirical for the empirical rule big idea here one standard deviation within one standard deviation we should be catching 68 percent of our data we do and that number was just rounded this is much 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 more precise if it's an perfect normal curve. So you can get the idea here. So instead of writing all this, yuck, what we're just going to say is what is the probability of two of our value falling somewhere between two and six? And I'll just make the approximate symbol. It is approximately 68%. Um, but you can see, well, excuse me, but you can see from actually looking at our curve, we can see it's actually much better than that. So now let's talk about the uh, uh, the next big concept here, the next big thing we need to focus on. Now, if I, I told you we're going to have a table that kind of does all that for us, um, but if the the table would become extremely complex if we had to always focus on all of our standard deviations and our means. So, what they did is they came up with what they call the standard normal, and what they said for the standard normal is your mean is always equal to zero and your standard deviation is always equal to one. So now when we go and type that in our calculator it becomes much 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 more simple um, because so much of it is going to be replaced by ones and zeros. So the first number here that two was just a one because it was a standard deviation so we actually don't even need it. Um, so really, now all we have there is 1 divided by 2, square root of 2 pi. So now here, it was x minus the mean, but the mean is 0. So again, we don't even need that part now. So now it's just negative x squared divided by, and the denominator was the, uh, was 2 times the, the um, standard deviation, standard deviation is 1, so it's 1 squared. So once one squared is just one, so really we don't need any of that now. Whoops, excuse me. 
there we go. There we go, got that straightened out. So you see that part becomes much easier. Now it's just negative x squared divided by two. So now when we hit graph, the you'll see our graph is now shifted. We still have the normal curve. It has a slightly different shape. Um, but you'll notice we are now centered around zero, so we have to change our window. So, but now we're thinking of everything in terms of standard deviations. So I need to, I want to see four standard deviations down, four standard deviations up, and I can still see the same 0.5. And now our curve will look a little more similar because the the last window we had was just a little more squished. So now if we do our um, integral from one standard deviation down, so that'd be negative one, to one standard deviation up, you will see we get the same 68.2 and change. So it's amazing. So now what we know is we if we just if we always use a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, we can just use this curve, and we can use this table that we have in the book. So what is the formula that we're going to use to change everything to the standard normal? Well, it's actually quite simple. Um, and in a person-to-person -person class, I actually have you guys figure it out on your own because it's so simple. Um, but it is called a z-score, or the table sometimes called a z-table as well. So the z-score is very simple. It's just your, your data value that you would like to check minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So, for example, the one we just did, um, we wanted to find the, value, the probability between be, of being between 2 and 6. So what we're going to do here is use the value of 2, so 2 minus our mean, which was 4, divided by the standard deviation, um, which was 2, and we do the math, so a very, very complicated math, so that, make it, that would make it negative 1, which makes sense, because we purposely picked it to be one standard deviation below the mean. So you see what this formula is doing is just converting all of your values into how many standard deviations from the mean are they. So the value 2 is one standard deviation below the mean. So therefore I do the exact same thing with the 6. 6 minus 4 is 2 divided by 2, so that's one standard deviation above the mean. So now what we're really saying here is instead of saying what's the probability of my value being between 2 and 6, what we're going to say is what is my what is the probability of my z's being between negative 1 and 1. So I'm saying standard deviations. What's the probability of being within one standard deviation down, one standard deviation up? Well, we know because of the empirical rule, that's approximately 68%. So I hope that makes sense. So now let's look at the z-table. Now the z-table is located in Canvas. You can just download it. Um, it will be provided for you on the final exam. So if you need it, you don't need to memorize it. Let's take a look at what it, what it is. So here you go. Now, the key thing to understand, first thing to understand is Every z-table is different. Every standard table is different. So therefore, you have to read the directions up at the top, um, because in one class, it may be using it this format. In another class, it may be using something else. So big idea. Um, this one is saying the values are the are measure from the mean, from 0, up to whatever value you're putting in. Everything is given in this probability. So therefore, if someone, if you look, in, if you're looking at the table at the value of, of excuse me, not three, if you're looking at the value of one, what we're saying here is how much area is there between zero and one. So now let's go find our value. When you look, z, here is 1.0, and we don't have any more decimals, so we're going to stay right here. So that's going to give us uh, 0.3413. So I know. The probability of z, uh, just of, of my, my scores for one standard deviation, is 0.3413. But that's just going up to 1. So what about going down to negative 1? Well, because the whole, the whole graph is symmetric, if it's point, so if going up is 0.3413, then going down would be 0.3413. So when we add those together, magically you get your 68.26 that we saw in the calculator. So I'm hoping that makes sense. So now what if you did your math, you did your little problem, and you found that your z ended up being something like, let's just do one of the numbers. Uh, what if we said what's the probability of z being, well, actually I'll pin it between two. Well, yeah, we'll pin it between two. So z being between 0.1 
and point, excuse me, being between one point, one, two. All right, so how do you read the table? That's the key thing to understand, because uh, sometimes it just gets a little goofy. So when you look at the table, you'll see this is 0 0.1, so we're in our, del our uh, excuse me, to our level of accuracy needed. We need 0 0.1. There's no other decimals, so we're going to stay right there. Um, so from going from 0 to 0.1, it's going to be 0 0.0398 for this part. Then going up to 1.12, so this is 1.1, but we have another, we need the 2. So what we have to do is find the right column that has the 2 in it. There it is. So there's our value right there. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. So now that's going to be 0.3686. And because these things are, are both above the mean, it actually gets a little funny. So if you think about your normal curve, I always recommend drawing these out to get really good at them. Where would the value of 0.1 be? Well, that means you're 0.1 standard deviations above the mean. So you're going to, this one's going somewhere right in there. So this first value, let's call it the red shaded region. Okay. Now, the next one is 1.12. So this, this one was 0.1. The next one is 1.12. So this 3.686 is this green shaded region coming all the way down. Notice we have some overlap. So if I want to know, if I really want to know, though, I don't want to know the whole thing. I want to know just from, whoops, excuse me, I want to do that in a different color. If, we want, if I want to do it just from the first one to the second one, I've overcounted. This is too much because it's counting the red region, too. So to get the, my values, I have to do 0.3686, take away 0 0.0398 and that will give me my answer to that problem. So that will give me the answer of what is the probability of falling between 0.1 and 1.12, whatever that answer is. And I know everybody's dying to know. So it is 0.3288, so 32.88% 32 32 chance of being between 0.1 standard deviations and 1.12 standard deviations. So when you're doing any of these problems, just remember they're little geometry problems. Draw the picture, get the probabilities, and either add, subtract um, to get the right answers. Um, another, oh, another hint, just, just a, another little tip that sometimes is, comes up and is handy. When you're doing this, if you just remember, if you're looking at the mean and you're looking at everything above the mean, it's 50%. And the same thing going down. Sometimes that's a, a nice little way to kind of speed through some problems. So now we're almost done with 8.5. You've got the big idea. You understand the normal curve. You understand the, or you, you have ex exposure to um, the standard normal curve, where all we're going to do is just take all of our values and convert them into number of standard deviations away from the mean using this Z formula. Um, so the only thing we need to worry about now is the special, special case. When we're dealing with binomial distributions, we have a very special uh, scenario because remember binomial distributions that's your that's your um, Bernoulli Bernoulli trials success and failure so the nice thing we can do here is we can use all these these great little formulas so for example the mean is equal to your number of trials times success the probability of success um, and, and you can think about that very logically as a quick example if you say um, you're going to flip a coin um, flip a coin 28 times, okay? And if I asked you what's the probability, or let's just talk about this because we just want the average. So how many heads would you expect on average? Well, we know that the average is just going to be the number of trials times the probability of flipping a heads, which would be 0.5, and as logic told you, this would be 14. You expect 14 of them. There you go, Bernoulli trials. Um, so now we can say a standard deviation is the square root of n times p times q, where if you recall, n is the number of trials, p is the probability of success, q is the probability of failure, or aka, aka q is equal to p, sorry, 1 minus p. So you can always use that. How easy is that to get your, that, that makes it so easy to get your standard deviation? So now we just need a little alternate formula for dealing with our, with our probabilities. 
And there are some caveats to this formula I'm about to show you, that it, it only works for things that are within three standard deviations of the mean. Good news, your final exam, everything will be within three standard deviations of the mean. Um, bad news, if uh, sometimes WebAssign has a little glitch and it will give you a problem that falls outside three standard deviations of the mean. But what you can still do is you can do the integration in your calculator, you still get the right answer. Um, but it's just a little more work for you. You can't use the z-table. So here's, your, here's the change. What we're going to do is we're going to extend the range just a little bit for these, these um, binomial distributions. So you notice the low end, what we're going to do is take whatever our low value is, and we're going to subtract 0.5. Okay? Then for the high end, we're going to add 0.5. So if you can imagine what's going on here, we had some some range of numbers, A and B, and what we've done is said, take the A, move it a little bit that way, take the B, move it a little bit that way, make them a little bit bigger. Um, add a little bit of probability, extra probability in there to uh, make up for any error that we have because we're treating it as a uh, binomial distribution. And to help you see that, I, I grabbed a little picture from the book. Oh, let me get it a little bigger. Um, so what you'll see here is because it's binomial, binomial we're implying that it's it, it, you can only have success or failure, and that it's um, something discrete. So therefore, you can have five airplane crashes or six airplane crashes, but you can't have five and a half. You can't sort of crash. You either do or you don't. So what they're saying here is you'll notice that there's error on the inside of our curve. If you kind of see, there's a little bit of error, you know, extra extra area that we that we counted, um, but then on the outside there's area that we missed. So by extending everything out, um, because when we move it out uh, by a half, um, it, it makes up for the error. That's the idea there. Uh, you don't really need to understand it. You can just do it. Whatever makes you happy. But you'll see here now they've switched. We switched the variable to y just to say that look we have toyed with this a little bit but that's okay. So now, then you would proceed like normal. Um, so let's just make up some values really fast so you can get the idea here. Let's just say, let's go back to, well, let's not. Let's go, let's call that 2 and call this 12. And let's say we have a mean, excuse me, wrong mean. Um, let's say we have a mean of 7 with a standard deviation of 5. Okay, so what, what are, and we say, someone asks you the question, what's the probability that your values are going to fall between 2 and 12? Okay, so now what we're going to say is, well, we're going to, and, and we're going to say this is a Bernoulli trial. These things came from Bernoulli trials. So the 2, we're going to subtract 0.5, which would make it 1.5. The B, that was 12, so we're going to add 0.5, so that would make it 12.5. Now we proceed just like normal. You find your standard deviation, you find your average. You can use using these special little formulas up here to make your life easy. Um, so now we're just going to change this into our z values once again. The probability of um, our value, 1.5, minus the average divided by the standard deviation is our z value. Uh, and then we continue exact same way, 12.5 minus 7 divided by 5. Um, and now that we have those, you end up with those values completely by accident. Those are totally random, that we, but we got the same numbers, negative 1.1 to 1.1. So now we would go to our z table, find the value for negative 1.1, find the value for 1.1, add them together, and you'd have your answer. So that's, that's how you handle those Bernoulli trials. It's just a little tweak. Um, and don't forget, Bernoulli trials is also binomial distributions, um, just binomial being dual, du two different outcomes. So that is that. I hope that was helpful. Um, I will have some examples of problems in videos to follow.